What's up, folks? It is So Bad It's Good with Ryan Bailey. This is your pal Ryan, and this is your Thursday episode. So close to the end of the week. How the heck is everybody doing out there? If you hear my voice, I am still fighting <clears throat> this head cold. You know, it's, uh, I, you know what? You get to a certain age and you're like, that's a head cold. When I was younger, I didn't know the differentiation between a head cold and a cold. And then you get older and you're like, that's a head cold. <laughs> so I'm dealing with a head cold right now. But don't worry, that's not going to stop me from blabbing this big old mouth to you guys. Now, this week is the first week without Vanderpump Rules. You you remember that show, Vanderpump Rules? Do you guys remember Scandaball? Oh, it's so long ago since we ended the last season. Uh, no, it was just last week. But I figured... Let's do one more time with feeling because I told you about this Secrets Revealed episode. They aired this exclusively on Peacock last week, Vanderpump Rules Season 11, Secrets Revealed. And I have to tell you, it was a pretty damn enjoyable Secrets Revealed. It was so much fun. Each scene was so funny, full, chock full of just character development. Uh, I mean, idiocy, everything that you could hope for. I was like, how did this stuff get cut out? And some of the scenes that we saw get left in. It was that good. So I'm going to reenact the entire episode for you. So if and and, and this is no uh, no offense to Peacock, because Peacock is kind of like my number one favorite streaming service because I watch so much Housewives and Bravo. Uh, but it's damn good. But if you don't have Peacock, don't worry. You're gonna get uh, you're gonna get the full gist of it today on So Bad It's Good. Uh, let's see. We'll talk about a couple of other things <clears throat> before we get into that. As I slowly make my way through this episode, man, it is so weird. When you got this head cold, it's just like your head is just. It's like it feels like there's an anvil on it. Uh, man, this year I've been just hit with some uh some sicknesses back to back to back. We're gonna get healthy. This is the summer of health, folks. This is the summer of Bailey, the summer of So Bad It's Good, the summer of the baddies. It starts after I feel better from this head cold. Anyways, let me tell you a couple of things. Guess what I'm doing this weekend? This is, is going to blow some of you away. Now, uh, a couple of listeners reached out a while ago, and Meditza and Sandra informed me about this, and it sounded, I was like, wow, this sounds really interesting. I'm actually... Because you do know I am a licensed um, officiant by the Universal Life Church, uh, which means I filled out a form online and paid a fee. So that means I am I can marry you. I can and I've done it two times in the past. And those were both with close friends. But I consider a lot of my listeners close friends. So they asked me to marry them. So I am going to marry two listeners this weekend. And here's the kicker, folks. It's in. Overland Park, Kansas, which is close to, I mean, it's right in that same vicinity where I grew up, Olathe, Kansas. And so uh, me and Meditza met with them on a, uh, a Zoom call a while back, and they just were so lovely, so great. I was like, are you guys out of your minds? And they assured me they weren't. And I couldn't believe that I was asked to be a part of a special event like this, you know, without knowing them, you know, completely, you know, like family. But uh, I, nevertheless, I was so, um, so honored to, you know, I'm going to totally ruin your wedding. No, I'm so honored. I can't wait. I hope I can make this very special or just not get in the way at all. But the, the other thing that really meant something to me was this being an Overland park, because I really want, I haven't been back to Kansas in God. I mean, really, since I was 16 or 17 years old. Isn't that wild? Um, but I grew up there. We moved there when I was like two or th three. And then we moved away from Kansas when I was 14 years old. And we moved to Arizona. And But all of my childhood, all of my memories, all of my initial imagination, I remember from Olathe, Kansas. I remember it, all of it, my love of pop culture. I remember growing up on Claiborne Street and I was on a street of all girls. Like a lot of people would be like, well, wh why do you get along well with, with women? And I, I always attribute it to my mom, but also attribute it to living on Claiborne around uh, Jenny Becker and Daniel Marquis and Mary Mulcahy and Rachel Beaker and all of these ladies. And they would fight over which new kid on the block that they loved the most. 
and I would just be able to tag along, even though I did have a secret crush on Rachel Beaker and she was really into Joey McIntyre. And um, I tried to make myself look like Joey McIntyre and uh, I had kind of wavy curly hair as I do now, but it was much curlier. So I even cut my hair in like a reverse triangle like Joey McIntyre had on the Step by Step album cover. And uh, so I looked enough like Joey McIntyre for the kids at my new school when I moved to Arizona to pick on me and throw me into lockers and say, fucking new kid. But I didn't look enough like Joey McIntyre for Rachel Beaker to give me the time of day. But we were also so young. We were so young. It was a different time, right, folks? Um, but everything. So, I, I mean, I can't wait to go back there. But I also I can't wait to I'm going to go to the street. And I, I just there's so many memories of my mom there. And. Um, I just want to go back there and, uh, and see where I grew up and all of these memories of growing up on this street and, uh, with my mom and, uh, going to Indian trail junior high and Olathe South high school, go over to there, check that out, go to Oak park mall. If that still exists, uh, Metcalf mall was the one that was a little further out. I want to see if the seven 11 is still there that I used to, uh, steal, money out of uh the coin jar that my parents kept for me but i would take a couple of quarters and go to the 7-eleven and buy comic books and a thirst buster i want to see if that's still standing or uh the dylan's grocery store where i got busted when i was 12 year old 12 years old for stealing batteries oh that's right folks your boy shoplifted batteries the last time i've shoplifted something ever in my life i got caught when i was 12 years old imagine this it's the 20 December 26. I remember this like it was yesterday. My mom went to Columbus, Ohio to visit her sister and her mom. So my dad had me and my sister Kara to himself and we got Game Boys that Christmas. I mean, that was a big gift. You kidding me? I got a Game Boy and I got Christmas cash. I got some Christmas dough, right? But this was my 12 year old head way of thinking. And I want to say this is a so bad it's good uh, uh, lesson. Kids out there listening, I know that I know a lot of 12 and unders listen. Don't shoplift. Just don't. Don't steal anything. Just steal hearts, but also be kind to them. Uh, I'm looking at you, Jax. Um, but we go to this Dylan's grocery store to pick up. I remember it was like a, a milk. Probably we were big cereal eaters back then. And I didn't, I had Christmas cash in my pocket, but I didn't want to spend money on batteries for my Game Boy. I was like, no, that's not, that's not an exciting way to spend Christmas cash. So I shoplifted double A batteries and I thought I was all sly. My sister and my dad were there. We walk out after we buy the milk and all of a sudden this guy stops us and it's a plain clothes security officer and says, sir, we have reason to believe that, uh, that, uh, you know, your son here. Uh, stole something. And my dad was like, no, no, he didn't. No, no, he didn't. And I, you know, me, I'm like, oh shit, I did like, oh no. Oh no. Like, didn't even know that there was playing. I didn't even know that was a thing when you're 12 years old. You don't even know that's a job. You're like, that's a job. Um, and then he looks at me and realizes I'm guilty. And the look on my dad's face, oh, the anger, the disappointment. Oh my God. I have, I have felt worse since, but like, it was, uh, it was a pretty bad one. It was a pretty big one. And we had to go back into the grocery store in the offices and I had to empty my pockets, the batteries. But then when my dad really lost it was when he saw me put the Christmas cash on the table and he was like, are oh, you got to be kidding me? You even had money. Disgusting. He was. And by the way, was disgusting. True. Very true. Um, I got off with a warning. Police weren't called. Um, and, uh, you know, and then the horrible. Then I had to get home. And my dad made me call my mom in Ohio and tell her what I did. Now, <clears throat> after the fact, I realized that my dad had already called my mom and braced her, but I still had to call. And I just remember that was another like, mom, mom, I'm so sorry. I, I stole uh, batteries from Dylan's, the grocery store and the disappointment in her voice. And then, oh my God, I just remember my dad chewing me out of like, how dare you? How dare you? Oh my God, this is shame, shame. And it was, it was, and he was, he was scary, angry, you guys, scary, angry. Um, and then I know he probably felt bad about that because 
he then took like later on, I think he just, you know, I was just in my room, like, ah, ah, you know, the crying where you're like, ah, 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 you can't breathe. Ah, 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 and you're like sobbing. And you're like, ah, ah, ah. Like, <laughs> probably the noise was just scaring the neighbors. And I remember he didn't know really how to probably talk to me after he yelled at me, but he took me and my sister to a movie. I was like, wow. That's the lesson there. You, you steal something, you get yelled at really bad, but eventually you get taken to a movie. No, uh, it was, uh, God, that memory. There's so many, so many Kansas memories, you guys. I remember there used to be this thing called the trails behind Scarborough Elementary School that I went to their elementary school. And it was just this big wooded area, which I want to see if it actually still exists because that's where you would take your dirt bikes and there was like all these hills you would jump and stuff. But your boy being an idiot, he, it was also, I've told this story years ago on this podcast. It's been a minute. I don't. I think if you've listened to this podcast long enough, you know that I don't think like a normal person and my imagination where it can be funny and potentially annoying. It can also show how wrecked my way of thinking is like it is truly not logistical for somebody that sometimes comes off logistical. So I thought up until the age of like 14, like a scary old age, like I thought up to the age of 14 that being a superhero is like a real career option. Like it was like, you know what? If you work hard enough, because it was like you couldn't be Superman, Spider-Man, Green Lantern, any of the ones with actual superpowers. But that's where Batman gets you because Batman doesn't have superpowers. Now, of course, when you're that young, you don't think, well, he also has like billions and billions of dollars because his parents died, all this shit. But when you're a kid, you're like, you know, if my agility is good enough if I, my detective skills are on point, I could legitimately be Batman. So I would, uh, in our basement, Kansas famous for basements, I would practice and it would just like, I would set up this, um, little like obstacle course where you would have like, there was like a throwing bounce back thing where you'd throw a ball and it would bounce back. It was like a net that would like bounce it back. So I would like practice that like a thousand times a day. And I got to tell you folks, as much as I practice, I never got good. I'm the klutziest person. My reflexes suck. It's like, I knew deep down, like I knew, I still thought you could be a superhero, but I think deep down, like I also knew that it potentially, I wasn't going to be good enough to be one. Like, you know, like they existed in real life. I just wasn't going to be able to do it. But my imagination was such that I thought, yeah. And I took my my mom's witch's costume from Halloween and had a big gray cape. So I had this big gray cape. Uh, I had these spandex shorts, which was like red and black. And then I would wear a black t-shirt and I would wear one of those Lone Rain Ranger like plastic max masks. And it, the, the witch's cape had a hood uh, that would go over your head. And then I got a bull whip from like Silver Dollar City when we visited there on vacation. And so my house backed up right on uh, the trails when we had moved. And so I would go in this costume and I would go in the woods and I would just hide behind trees and I would try to eavesdrop on other kids because legit, I mean, God, I'm scaring myself as I go further into this story, but I truly, I thought this was like practice. This was like rehearsing being a superhero. It was like stealth. And the only person that caught me ever was my sister. And my sister was like, are you an idiot? Like, and I was like, yes. But I mean, just, I was like, don't tell mom. Don't tell mom my secret identity. Please, please, Kara, how dare you? You're going to get me caught by the police and mom. So yeah, so many good memories. But I, uh, I'm really excited to be back there. I just haven't, uh, that was part of it. I was like, yeah, I would love to go back and and kind of, relive those memories because i think about it so often and i've thought about it so much this year with mom passing i just uh it's it's uh think about it all the time so i really um am very happy to to go there and, and do this wedding which sounds wild right and uh they're such a nice sweet couple but anyways that was the story also i wanted to tell you last night i um <clears throat> i went to you know, you know, the, the band, the talking heads, uh, led by David Byrne. I think it's one of the best band. They're no longer together, unfortunately, but just so many, just such amazing music. It's a band started off playing at like CBGBs in like the, uh, the seventies, I believe in New York when CBGBs was still open and they progressively just got better and better and more well-known. They started getting hits like once in a lifetime and burning down the house 
But they made this film 40 years ago called Stop Making Sense. It was a concert film directed by the late director, Jonathan Demme, who went on to direct and win the Oscar for Silence of the Lambs. Um, and it's widely considered the best concert film of all times. And uh, they shot it at the um, the Pantages Theater in Hollywood. So last night, they did a screening of Stop Making Sense at the same theater, Pantages, 40 years later. And then all four of the Talking Heads reunited for a Q&A afterwards. And I, I've loved Stop Making Sense since, uh, you know, it was like I, I'm such a a geek aficionado that, you know, you would read those lists in Rolling Stone or Spin Magazine of like the top films in, you know, music concert films you need to see. And that was always in it. And when I was a kid, David Byrne always scared me because he would wear that big suit that like was like three times his size. And I was like, who is this skinny man in the big suit? He scared me as a kid. Um, and then I just, I, I watched that film and I loved it. And even this year, I'll always go back and kind of listen to a band. I love their whole catalog again. And it was such a joy this past year going back and listening to the Talking Heads and their music. And you could see the progression of their music and how they got like kind of more funky, more soulful, more playing around. And I think they're such a great inspiration to bands that I love now, like LCD Sound System and, you know, even some jam bands a little bit. But they did it in such a way like you want to dance when you hear Talking Heads music a lot of the time. And uh, they don't get talked about nearly uh, as much as I would like for them to be talked about. But I love them. And I got to go do this sold out. Uh, but it was it was uh, great to see. It's like a new 4K restored print that A24, one of my favorite movie uh, companies, released this past year. So I, I went and did that. And that was uh, magical to to see that new print and to see all four of them together. I mean, they're in their 70s now. And you think 40 years ago, they were on that stage doing this film and uh, we're still here 40 years later watching it and appreciating it and dancing to it. We were all sitting in like theater seats and then like halfway through the film, you know, I think it was like burning down the house came on and then everybody just stood up for the rest of the film. And I had the head cold. So I was like, are we going to really stay? I told you, like I went to that Sarah McLaughlin concert last week. We started sitting down and at first I was like bummed, but then I was like, nice, we're sitting. I love sitting. And then last night, we're at a, you know, this, this watching this movie, uh, sitting down at first, everybody's standing up. I'm like, wait, we can just pick a lane, everybody. Okay. So that's what I did. What did you guys do? Did you have a, a big Wednesday night? What is today? No, today's, we, do you have a big Tuesday night? Today's Wednesday. Got it. Great. We're on, we're on fire today. Okay. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about the Valley before we get to Vanderpump rules, because Jax is Jaxing again. Jax tweeted and dirty deleted something in the wee small hours of the morning said, Hey, why don't you ask Brittany who she's been sleeping with the last four months? Dot, dot, dot. He gave us an ellipses ellipses. The scariest form of punctuation known to man are the ellipses, but he did that. He tweeted that out and then he deleted it. But everybody, smart Bravo fans, Bravo fan. I mean, Bravo fans, they stay up 24 seven. Now they are, and 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 why that's a wise move because you know our bravo celebrities <clears throat> they're a troubling and troublesome bunch so he tweeted and deleted this and then he tried to make like he tried to make it make sense later on an instagram story and posted a picture of cruz and britney sleeping together with cruz sleeping at an angle and said Oh, he does this every night, every night. So uh, then going, if we had taken that tweet and delete going, guess who Britney slept with for the past four months, we would then be like, oh, Cruz. And I'm telling you, this guy, this is how his mind works. He thinks deviously, but he does it in the stupidest way possible. So he thinks he's outsmarting everybody and he wants you to feel bad for him. But at the same time, he thinks he's getting one up on everybody. It's just that we know Jax's moves inside and out. It's like if we had never met Jax before this year, you would potentially feel bad for him and you'd believe everything he said. But that's the problem with growing up on reality television. We know this guy's moves in, in and out. And the thing is, Brittany always believed in Jax until this episode, the final episode of the Valley. And finally she wised up and going, I see what you're doing. You're crazy. You're just doing this because the cameras are up. Jeez. And you're like, I'm still, I'm so damn impressed by Brittany on that final episode to be so clear in her thinking. And that is such a hard thing to do. 
And then just to see how Jax manipulates. And, and by the way, I'm not saying that Jax isn't troubled. I think he truly is troubled. I think Jax probably really hates himself. Like he loves himself, hates himself. It's probably this weird form of narcissism that I don't even know exists that he thinks he's the best, but also thinks he's the worst and also loves everybody, but also hates everybody, you know? And he especially hates people that love him because I think he hates himself so much that he can't, he can't respect anybody that loves him after what he's done to them. Does that make sense? Sometimes that's the vibe I get. I am not a therapist. I am probably wrong, but that is the old Ryan vibe that I get. Um, but also, let's take his tweet and delete. Let's say, okay, let's ask who Brittany has been sleeping with for the last four months. Okay, for, hey, Brittany, who you been sleeping with? But also, good on you, Brittany. I hope you have been sleeping with somebody. I hope they are rocking your world. I hope you are feeling loved. I hope the, you're feeling sparkly everywhere. I am in full support of that. I am in full support of that. Like, you know, two things we always say, two things can be true at once. You know, Brittany, we saw really tried, really tried in that marriage. We saw how many times that Jax treated her like dirt. So we saw that, but we also see somebody that is like wanting to push forward, wanting to still keep a positive attitude, wanting to, but like, I, Jax, I don't care who she's sleeping with, man. I'm like, great. Also, we'll see it in season two of the Valley. Don't, don't, uh, don't burn yourself out tweeting before we can get it on film. You know what I'm saying? When I saw that tweet, I was like, damn it. This is what I said last night. The cameras need to be up now. Also, once again, I want to point out, I saw a lot of people feeling bad for Jesse Lally. And I feel bad for him because you can tell he wanted that marriage to stay intact. I think for the wrong reasons, though. But I also want to point out, like I did in the Valley recap, is that Jesse Lally, you also have to see, we saw this side of that relationship. We didn't see the years before when he was probably behaving a certain way to turn Michelle off fully from her, you know? So we're seeing this now where he's like grasping for straws and going, well, I thought you had a strong family value ethic and that's why you should be staying. And I guess you don't. And I'm going to blame you for everything that happens from this point on. No, like we didn't get to see how he initially was. And you can see that this dude is a very intense dude. So you can have empathy and feel bad for somebody, but also realize that the right decision was made. And I can 100% say that because also we see that he is now with somebody else and he does seem happy. I do want to see the lighter, funnier side of Jesse Lally. I'm down to see that. Like, listen, we that's what we keep saying about seasons. Like Lala, horrible season, in my opinion, for Vanderpump Rules. Next season, she'll, she'll probably have a great season. Listen, Rome wasn't built in a day. Things take time. Things change over time. I mean, I never thought I would say that Erica Jane had a good season, but there I was last season going, well, for the most part, a way better season than she's had the previous three or four seasons, even before the Tom Girardi stuff. So things change. People change. Your feelings on people change. And I think that's what keeps us coming back to reality TV because you just never know. You never know. I think the one thing that we can rest assured, though, is Jax Taylor, while he is reality TV show gold, he is not relationship gold. And so Brittany needs to get as far away from him as possible. If he cannot do the fair, the bare minimum to try to protect and save his relationship and marriage, then no. If he can't do the bare minimum of, he says it takes too long to drive to the therapy. You know, you can do therapy online too. Oh, well, I don't have a strong enough Wi-Fi signal. I mean, the wi you got to have a good strong, I mean, Wi-Fi these days. I don't have to pay extra for a router. I can't, I can't do it. I can't do it. I guess I am who I am. Oh, woe is me. I'll meet you at Jackson Studio City. Come on by. <sighs> Anyways, folks. Um, okay, should we do it? Okay, so this is Vanderpump Rules. Secrets revealed exclusively on Peacock. Let's do this one more time with feeling. Have fun with it. Be silly. We'll do the voices. We'll get it out of our system as we lay in wait. Oh, shit. I forgot to tell you. They officially did the Traders Season 3 announcement. We talked about this on Monday's episode, but it all, like, in fact, more, uh, more cast came out. I didn't realize the other people. We talked about some of them, but then other people, I was like, whoa, that is new. Primarily, Sam Ashkari. Britney Spears' ex-husband. He definitely is a traitor. <laughs> Sam, Sam Ashgar. You got, you got Boston Rob, Rob Marciano from Survivor, Dorinda, 
Grishel Styles from Selling Sunset, Brittany Haynes, Big Brother, Daniel Reyes, Big Brother, Bob the Drag Queen from RuPaul's Drag Weight Race, Wells Adams, The Bachelorette and Bachelor in Paradise, Chanel Ion, The Real Housewives of Dubai, Gabby Windy, The Bachelorette. Gabby's the one that has that light. I had that light Marilyn Monroe voice. Okay. Uh, Dylan Efron, down to earth with Zach Efron. I'm guessing that's Zach's brother, Dylan Efron. Tony Vla- Blachos, Survivor. Jeremy Collins, Survivor. Dolores Catania, The Real Housewives of New Jersey. Robin Dixon, or Dixon, The Real Housewives of Potomac. Bob Harper, The Biggest Loser. Sierra Miller, Summerhouse. Lord Ivar, Mount Batten, a British royal. They always need, like, because they had the one British dude in from Parliament last season. So now I guess they're sticking with putting just one British royal in a season. Uh, Carolyn Weiger, uh, Survivor. I can't wait. I love Carolyn on Survivor. And then Nikki Garcia, former professional wrestler, and Tom Sandoval. Or as uh, our host, Alan Cummings, says, Tom Sandoval. Tom Sandoval. I can't. Well, I really like, I, I can't wait to see Alan Cummings host again because I just loved learning more about how he speaks. And he like trills certain vowels and syllable. It's just so brilliant and people keep making memes and fun of tom sandoval being a part of this but i have to tell you bring it on baby like yes of course i would even rather sheena or lala get that opportunity for for this show than tom sandoval i don't know how these men of vanderpump rules keep getting all of these opportunities i will say if i was sheena i'd be like why can't it be about me like come on i would love to see sheena in the uh the trader's house. But Tom Sandoval, if we get past all of that bullshit, dude, I am going to be seated. And I got to tell you, a lot of people are like, he better get voted out first. No, he better get voted out last. Are you kidding me? I want him on it as much as possible. You'll see in this never the secrets revealed episode when he pops up. It's just hysterical. The guy is just thinking it's such a low base level that it is so funny. And for him to put together who a potential trader is, and you know he's gonna have to like tell people like, oh, what's up, dude? I'm Tom Sandoval, everybody. I'm here at Traders. Um, hey, Bob the Drag Queen. Um, do you know that I um cheated on I had an affair on <clears throat> my nine-year relationship, dude, and it kind of blew up. I was on CNN all of a sudden, and I was like, I'm not even that big of a celebrity. You know what I'm talking about, dude? Oh, dude, I miss Schwartz, dude. Do you miss Schwartz? I mean, like, come on, that's gold. That is TV gold. And anybody that says otherwise, uh, you're you you, come on. Yes, we want him. We need him. I hope he's getting paid the least out of all of them, but I cannot wait to watch. I cannot wait to, I mean, truly, I cannot wait to recap. It cannot be done soon enough. They are filming in the next couple of weeks and I just, I can't wait. I can't, can't wait. So blessed. Okay. We're also blessed to talk about this secrets revealed episode, which we will. Here we go. PR theme, baby. Light up the sky, burn it up like a candle. When life gets harder, too hot to hear. Oh, 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 you need is love in the boombox to make this world rock and bump to the roof stop. Dance if you know the words. Sing along. Go so hard at that part. Damn. Folks, this one is for you today, tonight, tomorrow, next month, whenever you are listening. So the Vanderpump Rules Secrets Revealed episode starts with Tweedledum and Tweedledee, the two Toms, Schwartz and Sandoval, sitting next to each other at the uh, the talking headset. And they kick us off and they're like, welcome to Vanderpump Rules Season 11 Secrets Revealed. And Tom does a shh, like don't tell your parents, shh. And Schwartz does a like mastermind putting his hands together like Dr. Evil. Now, the funny thing, there's so many funny things about this already hitting you over the head, but they're both looking looking at two different cameras and the producer's like, hey, 
um, you guys are looking in two different cameras and, and it sounds like, yeah, dude, look at this one ahead, dude. Also, there is something so dark about starting off a Secrets Revealed episode with Sandoval going, welcome to Secrets Revealed. Shh. Because he kept the biggest secret. Now, I don't even think he put it together of like, hey, could um, maybe potentially get James Kennedy to do this? Because I think the audience might goof on me a little bit because um, I was the biggest secret and I, I chose not to reveal it until my phone fell out of my pocket. It was a crazy story. Anyways, I was with my band. But you know what I'm saying? Like already he and Schwartz is like Schwartz, is like, that's a great idea. We'll start the show, dude. Oh, my God. Me and my roomie, man. So, yeah, they started off just douche chills everywhere. And then so it's like, OK, look in, look in there. And then DJ James Kennedy and Katie are together. And Katie's like, tonight we will show you. And they're all screwing up, but they're laughing like DJ James Kennedy and Katie Maloney next to each other smiling. It almost looks like they're brother and sister. They're glowing. And I'm like, did we this is what I was telling you just a second ago about how things change. You can never you got to be Gumby. Like, did we ever think that they would be smiling? DJ James Kennedy, I'm looking at his smiling face right here. He looks like Beavis. Like, shut up, Beavis. Shut up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm DJ James Kennedy. Yeah, yeah. But he's smiling, and Katie is smiling a big, toothy grin. Like, I haven't seen Katie smile like this in forever. And I'm like, wow. Remember back in the days when they passionately hated each other? And now here they are sitting next to each other, introducing a Secrets Revealed. And then Lala and Sheena are paired up. And Lola's like, tonight we'll show you never besieged. Not, not never besieged. Did I say never besieged? I'm the softer side of Lala. It's never before seen. And little Lala's like, get it right, bitch. Get it right. What the fuck? This is why they have cue cards. But anyways, it's like everybody's smiling and happy. It's nice. It's nice to see all of these people together. Even Sheena and Lala. They're like all laughing at each other. And uh, so we're going to start each scene and Schwartz is like, are you ready? And James is like, welcome to the Vanderpump Rules season 11 secrets revealed. And we see clips from what we're going to see. And we see a scene of like Tom asking Sandoval how many women uh, that he's slept with since Rachel. We see uh, Tom with his bleach blonde hair. We see Sandoval talking about rooming together. We see Lisa of like, oh, should we eat the pasta together at DJ James Kennedy's house? It's a collection of things that I thought I would never see in a million years. That's not true, actually. I just was smiling when I... So we're back with the talking head of DJ James Kennedy and Katie. And Katie's like, what qualifies you as an adult? What qualifies as an adult? And DJ James Kennedy's like, what qualifies as an adult, right? What qualifies? And then back to Sheena and Lala. And they're like, we raise kids. That qualifies as an ador- uh, uh, you know, an adult. And then Schwartz and Sandoval, we go to their talking heads. And Schwartz is like, I got a divorce. That makes you an adult. I um touched up some grays. Um, yeah. Uh, and then Sandoval, guess what Sandoval says? He's like, up there in your head or down there, dude? Up there in your head or your pubes, dude? He literally says up there or down there. This Sandoval, we've really, I've never noticed this in previous seasons. Was he always acting like, you know, a guy that got a dirty joke book in the sixth grade? Like legitimately, I mean, the reunion, every sex joke, but he's even doing it there. So like, hey, dude, you dye your pubes, dude. And by the way, unfortunately, Schwartz would probably be like, I did, dude. Joe said it would make me look cool. Oh, she fried my pubes, dude. Um, I mean, they look horrible. A lot of professional hairdressers said that's not how you're supposed to do the pubes. That's crazy, man. Um. Once again, a very dark thing of Sandoval making these overly sexualized comments. And you like, since I didn't notice it from him in the past, like, has he always just like, it's, he must've just been a gigantic pervert that has been hiding it for seasons upon seasons because I was under the doofus impression that when him and Ariana hooked up, it was like considered like, it's time to make love, dude. Are you ready to make love with Tom Sandoval? Huh? Tom Sandoval and the most extra bit of love that I'm about to give you. You know what I'm saying? Like, I legitimately thought that, like I legitimately thought he did like sax music playing, like a candle lit, like Enya in the background, mood lighting. I thought, you know, a galaxy light. I thought it was all that, but he just seems to like have like kind of a porn hub kind of a brain, you know? But anyways, Schwartz laughs 
And then DJ James Kennedy is like, was Lisa an adult? Is Sandoval? <laughs> yeah. Or like maybe Schwartz. And Schwartz and Sandoval are like, uh, yeah, we're fully adult, dude. And Katie was like, well, two of them together make a full adult. So then we go on this timeline and we see July 11th and we get into Valley Village. This is our first never before seen clip. And we're at Tom Sandoval and Ariana's place. And we see Tom's bathroom. And there's all of these little tinctures of like potions. And, you know, his like his uh, probably his water weight shit pills. We don't see those because the dog got into him. I mean, think about how many insane details we had this season that Maya, the dog, had to get her stomach pumped or like say like shit on the couch because got in a bag of hundreds of Sandoval shit pills. Are you kidding me? Like, what a detail. You forget about these details because it's so insane that your mind tries to protect you from the insanity of it. But I am here to remind you that it was truly insane. So we see Tom's, like, uh, bathroom full of all these potions. It looks like, like, like a witch's den with, like, you know, modern farmhouse lighting. And we're in Sandoval's gym, which I told you, I feel like this episode should have also been like scratch and sniff because there is something in me that wants so badly to know what that gym smells like. Cause you know, it would smell like fucking diet slice, shit pills, like regret, yeah, <laughs> cockiness, whatever that smells like <laughs> Axe body spray, Maxim magazine, you know, those kind of things. So we see Tim, uh, we see Tom on his, uh, his his little bike working it out he's like oh and then ann knocks he's like hi it's me and smiling how's it going dude good how are you how was your birthday it was good dude it was good yeah got everyone out by midnight tom and we flash back to two days earlier when they were trying at the beginning of the season to compromise with ariana because ariana didn't want him to have a party he was like no you're not going to be bringing all these people into the shared house and in that flashback, Santa was like, what if, okay, let me, let me hit you with this. What if we compromise Dan and have people out of here by midnight? And Anne's like, okay, okay, I'll, 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 I'll check that out. Uh, yeah, actually say Tom is going to have people, um, but he will have everybody out by midnight. And then Tom goes, um, Tom in this scene, after Anne asked, did you get everybody out by midnight? He's like, yeah, yeah, pretty much. I mean, a little bit after, but yeah, pretty much. Yeah, 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 totally. And then Anne goes, okay, so do you want to go over bills? Oh, dude, not Bill, dude. Come on, dude. I'm an arts man, dude. I'm here to rock the people. I can't be bothered with numbers, Dan. Are you kidding me? But she has like all of these like binders and it's like all the bills that Ariana and Tom are, are splitting, right? So Anne gets a talking head and Anne is like, before the breakup, it didn't really matter whose credit card anything was on. But after the breakup, it, it very much did matter. <laughs> I hate my life. So that became a new aspect of my job, making sure that everything was even and balanced. It's a lot of math. And I'm not good at math. Like you just hear her pleading. I'm like, please let me work for you. Ariana. I can't do this much more. Please. Um, who is good at math though, really, besides mathematicians? He goes, okay, and what is the total of the bills, not counting the mortgage? She's like, we have Ellie, DWP, the pool cleaning, gardening, cable and internet, earthquake insurance. Roughly each person owes $8,314. Okay, so many questions. First off, when Tom, first $8,314 excluding the mortgage? Earthquake, cable, LA, DWP, $8,314 per person. So they have $16,000 in bills and then the mortgage on top of that? Th that's got to be including the mortgage, right? Even though they said it wasn't. I don't know how to, that is insane. I would legitimately be like, okay, I'm going to go get an apartment today. Let's sell the house. Are you out of your mind? Is it worth it, Tom, for you just to have a little gym and a place in the backyard to swim? You know, they have swim clubs. They have LA fitness like, oh my God, you'd get so much amazing female attention and male attention at like an LA fitness or a planet fitness or whatever fitness like you would clean up, dude, you would love it. Why are you holding on to this? But also when Anne is like, um, we have this bill, we have this bill. He's counting on the bike on his fingers and he's putting each finger up and you can tell it's like a fresh manicure and a fresh paint job. He's like, oh, one, uh, they everybody checking out my nails. Two, yeah, I've got this nail painted as well. Three, it is uh, very funny. He's like, okay, has she said anything to you about the house or, you know, at all, Anne, Ariana? And I, Anne's like, no, no. It was like over two months ago that I sent her this email 
and he goes to get his phone. He's like, I'm going to read it to you. I said, I'd love to talk to you about the next steps on our house. I will. Is she here? Is he here? And Anne's like, I don't know. Do you want me to check? Yeah, dude, this is like crazy. Like, guys, is she here? Camera people, is she here? Producer goes, she just got home. Dude, I want to be fucking like, uh, if she can hear me, dude. Producer goes, if she does, if she can hear you, that you're not talking, you know, like, you know, she she can't. And we see that the noise machine is outside that door. But I also like, is she here, dude? Oh, dude, I can't talk about bills if she's here, dude. I do not want to do this. It was like, it was the same thing with the cheating. Actually, I could do the cheating when she was there. I was actually pretty cool with that. I actually did it that one night in front of the driveway. That was when she was there. But also when uh, I took Rachel, Rocky, Raquel into the uh, the guest bedroom when Ariana was there as well. So I was actually, weirdly enough, isn't that crazy? That's a funny thing. I was actually much more comfortable when Ariana was there with the cheating. But talking about bills, I do not want her on the premises. No. And I also thought it was funny of like, let me read you the email. And I would be like... I was like, what's up, Ariana? You fucking lazy piece of shit. Get your lazy ass up and figure out what we're going to do, dude. Are you kidding me? Sign Tom. <laughs> it's so fun. I just love it. she here, dude? Oh, my God. You know, like, should we? Oh, no. What's Ariana going to do? Anyways, Tom's like, I'll give you, Ariana, $600,000 $600, cash based on the math. This is like us selling the property for $3.1 million, which is way above Zillow and Redfin value and definitely above market value. And then Anne, with the refinancing of this house, pulling her name off the loan, this goes from being a $10,000 a month payment to like a $20,000 plus dollar payment, dude. That's why. And Anne's like, and you can afford that? He's like, well, for about six to eight months. And Anne's like, that's a lot of money. That would be more Amazon lives than he's prepared to do for sure. She says in a talking head and then uncomfortably laughs. <laughs> oh my God. First off, Amazon lives. I don't even think would touch Tom Sandoval. So who knows? What's up, dude? It's me, Tom Sandoval. This is an Amazon live where I'm going to take you through some of my favorite products, dude. Um, Okay. This is cool. These are called poppers. And what? You <laughs> this is my fan. <laughs> This is my favorite nail polish. This is my favorite um, satin kind of going out kind of outfit. These are my favorite black tank tops. You can get them three for $20 through Hanes. Thank you, Amazon Live. No, but I just love this. He's going to offer a $600,000 cash uh, based off a $3.1 million valuation. And there are so many things wrong with that offer that I think we all know if you've ever, ever had looked into financing a house or anything. And I don't know if that meant he wanted her to keep the na her name on the loan so he could still pay $10,000, which at this point, I don't think, think that would be something he would ask because how would you ever ask that? And why would Ariana ever want to keep her money tied into anything that this man does ever again, period? Also, this man is extremely generous in terms of like paying all the band members, paying all this. You don't want to be associated financially just in case something goes wrong, right? He's also, you know, Schwartz and Sandys. You got loans out on that. You got, I mean, there's a lot happening financially for Mr. Sandoval. So you just got to make that clean break. They, in fact, announced that they are, they both agreed to do mediation on the house. So we're not even close to, we still have to go through mediation to decide what they're still going to do with that damn house. I mean, that's, it's really wild, but poor Anne is just like, I, you know, I signed up to clean up after a reality star, not legitimately do math that I was not trained for. But he was like, well, I got myself into this mess. I just wish I could go back. Huh. Pause. Wish we could go back, dude. He just said, wish we could go back. Yeah. And Anne's just looking like, okay. Like, what does that even mean? Like, that's the worst Back to the Future sequel ever. Like... Tom, it's me. It's me, Doc Brown. We're going to take you back to the future. We're going to go back to 2012 when you started encouraging Raquel and giving her confidence. We're going to take you back. Doc, what's up, dude? You built a time machine in the thermobile? You made a time machine in the Tom Tom motorcycle? Are you kidding me? Oh, dude. Dan, dan, dan. That's the power of Tom. That's the power of Tom. 
Uh, anyways, that's the end of that scene. And we go on the timeline and we see August 4th. We see August 9th, the Babysitter's Club. And we see a picture of Summer Moon. And we hear music. Every day's a weekend. Let's light it up like Broadway. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And we're at the Marina Del Rey uh, condo that Brock and Sheena used to live at before they moved to the Valley. And we see Sheena come down all dressed in the nines. We see Katie, Ariana, Lala all together. Female power, baby. You love to see it. So these ladies have come together like the Spice Girls if they were babysitters to babysit Summer Moon. Brock and Sheena are all dressed up to go out. And Brock comes down. He's like, eh, she's down. I put her down. She's a pretty heavy sleeper. It's going to be a couple of hours. And Lala tells Sheena and is like, yo, please do not babysit stalk me on your app, Sheena. Okay. And she's like, the app is just always on in the background. In a talking head says, as much as I have an OCD brain, I also have a rational brain. Lala is my girl. She is someone I absolutely trust. But then at the same time, you're going to stay in the house where I have blink cameras and an Alexa and I can fucking spy on you at any moment because I don't trust you. Baby steps. <laughs> and Brock's like, have fun, girls. Have fun, ladies. So Ariana's like, let's get comfy while Summer Moon is napping. And we see Penny Lane, Sheena's cat. The cat's like, help, help. We see uh, little nappies. Anyways, Lala asks Katie Maloney if uh, she would like to uh, be her baby daddy. Great. Um, and uh, Lala goes, I feel like I hear a little bub. I feel like I hear. Her. Okay, yeah, I'm going to go check on her. And Ariana's like, okay, I hear her too. She's up. I heard her. I heard a giggle. So Lala goes get Summer Moon and Summer Moon is like, Tom blocked me. Help. Anyway, Summer's like, yeah. And so they're going to play Play-Doh. And they're like, will you teach us how to do Play-Doh? Get the red out. And I, Summer Moon really is the cutest kid. Anyways, Summer Moon's like, it's a noodle. You made a noodle. You made a noodle with Play-Doh. He's like, it's, it's in a talking head. Brock is like, it's an experiment having a kid, right? Having a kid, you know, to like adults that don't have kids. Like they really don't know what to do. And she was like, one thing you didn't get to see in season nine that I wanted you to see was when Tom and Ariana babysit baby, baby summer. And we flash back to 2021 where Ariana's like, uncle Tom doesn't want to give you your blankie, your binky. And Tom's like, she looks uncomfortable, dude. And Ariana's like, you could actually do things to help Tom, like give her a binky. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, dude. I'm a rock star. Back to Sheena's talking head. She's like, my mom actually was also there just hiding in the bathroom. And in case they actually needed something, which is insane. I love that Sheena's place is almost like booby trapped. You've got cameras every, you got the mom hiding like under a bed, just ready to burst out at any point. She's like, it's, I mean, that's wild. The mom was hiding there just in case something went wrong. Like it's, The girls are like, do you hear a, do you hear a movement? Oh no. And then it's just Sheena's mom. But anyways, Sheena's laughing about it with Brock. It's like, this is a baby. And I'm sorry. No, I was not leaving my baby with just Tom and Ariana. I That's fair. Seeing what all happened, it's fair. Anyways, Lala's like, I'm so happy you guys came to, to do this with me. And Ariana's like, yay, Babysitter's Club. And Lala goes, I never thought Sheena would take me up on the offer uh, because she is so particular. I mean, she went through a lot with her first pregnancy. So this is like, you know, so if it's not her mom, she gets nervous. By the way, the whole time they're having this conversation, Summer Moon is like completely like just looking in the camera directly, like just like tripping over herself. They don't seem to actually be looking at Summer Moon, which is potentially dangerous. And that's what that's what the cameras are for. Anyways, Lalo goes, hey, listen, I was like, Sheena, go have a date with your husband. And Ariana's like, yeah, they say it takes a village and we're the village. And then. Then Katie's like, it takes a coven. No, it actually takes a coven. So that's a little cute scene. Then we go back to the July 8th. And this scene is entitled, It's Always About the Pasta. And we're at James and, Allie's, James and Allie's new house in Burbank. And we know that because there's a Southwest airplane flying directly over it. Zoom. So you know. And we hear DJ James Kennedy going, Ali, Ali Bali, Ali. She's like, come in. And he's like, oh, I can't believe. I'm so nervous. I, I'm cooking for Lisa Vanderpump. Good thing I can actually cook. I went to the stores and I got all the most expensive ingredients for Lisa. Nothing but the best for my queen. Okay. And he's like, mamma mia. 
the pasta at Erewhon cost, I think it was just $42.99 for just the pack of pasta. Handmade Italian pasta. Does not get a better than this. And he's like, I'm doing a pasta red sauce, Ali Bali, and then I'm doing a salad with tomatoes and cucumber. Look at this, look at this. Fresh mint just to top everyone's salad off. You know, you wake up, give it a good smack. I've And she's like, I've heard you do that. Only the best for Lisa Vanderpump. I've seen to have gotten some cayenne pepper in my eye. Ah, oh, ah. Oh. And then he's washing it over the sink. Oh, please, the ultimate betrayal. Lisa comes in, and this is what I, I said this last week. I said, you just, wow. It's a nice house, right? But it's not Villa Rosa. So watching Lisa, it, it it almost feels like she's doing charity work of some kind. You know, you're like, oh, this is she's visiting a poor family. You know, like there's no hanky and panky outside to greet you, like at the grotto in the front of the house. But she's like, hello, it's me, Lisa Vanderbilt in Burbank. Oh, I just passed Jay Leno. Oh, delightful. I can't believe Lisa didn't have make me go. I can't believe that. Um, but she's coming in. You can tell she's trying to be positive, but you can tell she's also very scared. I think she's just like, it's hitting her that there's different parts of Los Angeles. So everybody's saying, hello, the girls are hugging. You look cute. No, you look cute. And presents a gift. It's Bottega Louis macaroons, which is right by Tom Tom. So that's an easy gift to give. He's like, how proud are you? Bet your parents are proud. I can't believe I have my own house, Lisa. I know, right? I'm going to get emotional. I am. It's a big deal. James was so young when he started working for me. And we flash back to 2014 of the skinniest little DJ James Kennedy ever. He's like, hello, Lisa. How are you? I'm tiny James Kennedy. And she's like, look at that. The flowers are dead. There's a 2014 scene from Sir. These flowers just don't do what you've been told. Do everything. I've always seen so much potential, but now seeing him so settled with Ali in his house. This is perfect. Nick Elaine. Okay, over here, this is Ali's office where she gets all the business done. And she's like, this is where I do my readings, Lisa, during the day. It's still like a work in progress. And this is where it all happens. Yeah, this is where it all happens. And then James says the bathroom. He goes, this is where it all goes down, Lisa. She's like, it's a nice pool. Look at this. It is a big ass pool. And then Lisa looks like Lisa hears a plane. And she's like, that doesn't sound private. That sounds, that sounds like a commercial craft. That is a commercial. She looks legitimately scared. Like, oh my God, are we at war? Like she legitimately just looks up and, uh, oh, it's just a plane. We're on the flight path it was pretty close he said like, welcome to burbank lisa okay do you want to sit down lisa and we can eat salad first he's like oh, yes we'll eat it all together is that how we'll eat it and then she goes it's not about the pasta james it's not oh, remember james when you had your slogan it's not about the pasta <laughs> i'm quite it's called a callback james a callback we're doing it yes is this scene going well so far people and then we flash back to that 2017 with Lala and James fighting out on Fairfax. Uh, he's like, why is it about the damn pasta? Get over the damn pasta. Read between the fucking lines. It ain't about the pasta. Oh, oh, it's not about the pasta. Tonight it is about the pasta, Lisa. And we have Italian style music playing. He's like peppering things. Lisa is like putting like shaved Parmesan onto her pasta. It's like, it's really quite good. And Ali's like, he's amazing. So I went to Lisa. I went to Tom Sandoval's house today. I went there to get an apology. He, I didn't get it. He's still very defensive, very defensive. And then we flash back to that scene that we saw earlier in the season where DJ James Kennedy's like, are you sorry for betraying me, Tom? And she's like, betraying you, dude. Yeah, the ultimate betrayal. When you did that shit with Kristen, no, you're not going to talk about 10 years ago. So you want me to take accountability, but you won't? And then Lisa's like, I think he's so overwhelmed with his own problems that he hasn't really realized the kind of depth of hurt that he's created to you, for example. Wait, why? Because it's not important to him, maybe. I mean, he's been through a hell of a lot. He really has. Now, does he deserve some of it? Of course he does, Nicolaine. He deserves it. Yeah, but Lisa, I was willing to listen. I know, but did you tell him? I, I want to go back to how it was. Do, you know, I miss the group. We're all human. We all do fuck up. And at some point, we've got to have empathy. I think if you ever get it across to him, how badly you were hurt. And he's still acting like an arrogant little prick. 
you say, I did everything I could. But like, I'm not going to be that little kid, Lisa, that just says yes to everything he says anymore. I agree. Uh, you know, I don't need him anymore. Nor should you. I got everything that I need. And then Ali goes, he peed on his bush too. You peed on his bush? And we flash back to that night where he is peeing on uh, Tom's bush. And then Ali says, it's Ariana's bush too. Well, I was trying to talk to him, Lisa. I had to pee and then I left and I'm not going to go back in to use the restroom. We had to go to emo night. I didn't know what the bathroom situation was there. So I pissed on his lawn. And then he goes, oh, you rascal, you rascal, just when I thought you would change. I need to take you over my knee and spank you like nigga lane. Oh, we can all laugh now. But once again, we see another where Lisa was working overtime with Lala and Sheena and Jane. I mean, she went to fucking Burbank. She made a house call to be like, uh, try to understand where Tom's coming from. Please, we don't have a show if we don't have understanding. James. Okay. I want to see actually Lisa go to Jax's saloon. I want to see her go to Encino Bakersfield. I want to see her go to lots of different parts of Los Angeles and visit houses near airports as well. Okay. So now folks get ready, hang on to your coal mining asses because we've got a Joseph scene. All right. It's a no Schwartz zone. Which, by the way, uh, somebody sent me that Joe did another live and she had a sign that said no Schwartz zone. And I was like, girl, you are turning into exactly what you said about Katie. And I guess maybe this man has just driven every woman to do that. But, you know, it's like, let him go, Katie. Let him go. Let him go as well to you, Joe. Let him go. Let him go. Let him fly free. Anyway, so we have a Joe Schwartz scene. He's like, looking back, so we have like, we have these two guys, Schwartz and Sandoval, sitting next to each other in the talking head. And I love, it's like, he's like wistful. He's like, looking back on my friendship dynamic with Joe, I think I'm trying not to hurt her feelings. I in inadvertently did more damage than good. And Lala goes, I don't know what he said to her behind closed doors, but obviously he gave her enough to feel like they could be something. Fuck yeah. And Katie goes, listen, I've been a real dumb bitch in my day, even as recent as like last weekend. So I really feel like I should sit this one out. Good on you, Katie. And James is just laughing. He's like, oh, Katie made a funny. So this is August 4th, Breadsticks and Relationships. The scene is entitled. We open up on Tom Schwartz's apartment in Valley Village. And she's like, Tom. And he's like, Joe, what does OG stand for? And Schwartz is like, original gangster. No, a restaurant. He's like, oh, Olive Garden? Olive Garden, she says. Like, she literally goes, Olive Garden. Olive Garden. Oh, my God. It's so fun. Olive Garden. That's exactly how she says it. Olive Garden. In fact, tonight, if you have an Olive Garden near you, consider going out to it or just consider to your loved one, your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, whatever. Say, hey, do you want to go to the Olive Garden? But anyway, Schwartz is laying in bed with his dogs and he's like, Olive Garden, unlimited breadsticks, unlimited. Oh, that's the thing. I think the breadsticks are limited. And then Joe's like, oh, my God. And, he, and then she has this whole box of breadsticks. He's like, that's a stash. We should have a race to see who, who could eat more. And then Schwartz is like, we can sell these on the black market for like $5 a pop. And you know Joe's thinking about it because she probably sells like organs on the black market. Yeah, I sold three kidneys today on the dark web. <laughs> Not going to tell you whose they are, though. <laughs> Fair price. Anyway, so they're hovering in the kitchen over these breadsticks. And I got to tell you, they... Look, you know, Joe's stubbing one in the mouth and he's like, oh, my God, the first bite is sexual. Maybe, you know, this is my also a piece of advice for Schwartz. Maybe don't sexualize everything. You already have a big, gigantic dildo breadstick in your hand. Sorry, I know this is a family show, um, but like maybe don't sexual like, oh, the first bite is so sexual. Like if you are Schwartz, don't bring up or even hint about sexual body parts, anything around Joe, if you do not want her to think, because she is taking every little breadcrumb that you are breadcrumbing her with and going like, we will wind up together when he's 48. And we just know that's not where Schwartz's head is at. Anyways, in a talking head, it goes, Joe, we both love the Midwest 
NFC North. I think that's football. Um, Olive Garden. He goes, this is the ultimate version of diminishing returns, Joe, because the first one is so good. But the sixth breadstick, you hate yourself. And she's like, you're farting and you're bloated. And I talk and he goes, but you know, just friends hanging out. In the scene, he's like, should we set up a little picnic? Wait, did they give us extra dressing? And then you guys, he takes the dressing bottle. I mean, literally, just prepare yourself for this. And I know this is not a horror podcast or true crime, anything, but I just, there is a true crime being committed in this scene. He takes the salad dressing from Olive Garden. He un, I was like, he uncorks it. He uncorks it like a fine bottle of champagne. He, uh, you know, takes the lid off and he starts gulping it. And we're not talking a little sip. Like, oh, let me taste this, see what it tastes like. Ha ha, that's definitely the, the Italian dressing. He chugs it. And I got to tell you, I have felt things in my stomach watching this and re-watching this that I have not felt in a long time. Like, it might have given me an ulcer just watching this. And he's like, oh, it's so good. It's so good. Which I was like, oh, my God. Schwartz and Sandy's should sell shots of salad dressing just to be goofy because that's kind of their style. Um, but then Joe trying to be like, I'll show you I'm the woman for you. We match each other's freak. You know, she takes the bottle and chugs it as well. And this is where it's like, oh, man, you guys, you crazy kids chugging salad dressing. Uh, anyways, he's like, my turn. I'm going to drink it. He'll, this is so good. Anyways, Sandoval, in his talking head, he's like, with Schwartz, he's like, so Olive Garden picnic day at home for two. Is that like a friendship thing? He's kind of ribbing Schwartz. And Schwartz is like, oh, I think it was just like an Olive Garden appreciation night. And, um. I didn't think it was a date. And then he's pouring the dressing over the, the salad from Olive Garden. He's like, and then it, Schwartz uses a high pitched voice. He goes, Joseph, are you okay? And he's like, yeah, how are you? Um, like, you were sad last night, Joe. He's like, I didn't like being attacked. And we go back to hotel Ziggy and Schwartz is like, people are confused by us. And he's like, I, yeah, I mean, I love hanging out with you. It's like 10 out of 10. You're smoking hot. You're like the hot fire Marshall Bill. I just don't want to be in a relationship. And he looks to the side when he says it. He can't look to I just don't want to be in a relationship. You're like smoking. You're like smoking hot, yo. You're like fire Marshall Bill. And fire Marshall Bill, of course, is Jim Carrey's character from In Living Color, that uh, Fox, like SNL um, show from the 90s. And, you know, I don't know. Listen, the older I get, the more I don't understand how anything works. But I don't think, I don't think, if you're a girl, right? Say you're a girl. A lot of you guys are girls or women, whatever. And you are then, you know, somebody you like says, oh my God. Um, <laughs> oh my God, you are smoking hot. You look like Dr. Phil. You would be like, oh, I like the first part, smoking hot, but then I don't love that he said I look like Dr. Phil. You know, like, oh my God, is my mustache showing again? And that is what he is doing. So it's really, I'm even getting mixed signals of like, what the fuck are you legitimately saying, Schwartz? And Joe's like, oh, okay. He's like, we're getting married when you're 48, I thought. He goes, that's right. I've got eight years. And then in a talking head, he goes, Schwartz potentially could be my soulmate, but he's got a commitment issue. And I think when he was with Katie, it was almost forced. We flash back to 2014 of Katie saying, today I'm telling you that to take that next step with me or otherwise I need to move on with my life. Joe says, I'm never going to pressure him into something that he doesn't want to do because I've been there before. And then Schwartz, like, I, you know, that the, what I thought was a big dog bed. It turns out it was just like a Schwartz bed on their living room floor. He's like, let's watch a movie. And they take the big Schwartz bed on the floor, not a dog bed. And they just lay in front of the TV. So it is fun. It's like, you know, a preschool kind of vibe. Uh, but at the same time, they've also bumped uglies and know each other intimately, you know, like private part stuff. And so you're like, ooh. And but <laughs> Joe's like, I'm not going to pressure him. And then she goes, and guess what? You're going to regret losing me, Schwartzy. You know, like, so she does kind of come off mildly threatening, even though she's saying she's not going to be threatening. So it's a lot of, it's a mixed bag, mixed signals that, that I don't even think Joe understands the depth of her feelings. 
And you can really see for somebody that is like, you know, I'm the cool girl. I'm cool. I chill out. I don't give pressure is that ultimately she is forced to give pressure. And you can see now how she is kind of acting after the fact you do feel bad for, her, but you're like, oh man, it's, it's a lot. So anyways, they lay down and she's like, I feel like I'm going to vomit. And Schwartz is like, whose feet are dirtier over here? And he's like, I don't know. Let's look. And then they pick their feet up and they're just, it's disgusting. I mean, just gross. It's them naked, bumping, like, dirty feet. Okay, now we go over to Sheena and Ariana, and they're at the stretch lab, and which is so funny. This is what I talked about yesterday, last week, how they go to these on um, reality shows, these kind of new places that uh, Sheena's like, I can't wait to go get a stretch. This is going to feel so good. But it's not like they go to the stretch lab every week. It is not on their weekly calendar. Sheena will probably argue and go, I, it is now. But no, they do this so they can go someplace to have a scene and talk about the plot line, talk about the storyline for that season, right? Okay, so they're stretching or they're being stretched by these uh, ladies at the stretch garage or stretch gym. And Sheena's like, you're going to have to do a lot more of this because of Dancing with the Stars. And I feel like this is like Sheena trying to potentially get information uh, about Dancing with the Stars. And Ariana's like, I'm so excited, but honestly, I'm so scared. And she's like, I would be freaking out. Like, they actually, if they actually called me one day, and Sheena goes, I would freak out, actually, if they called me one day. She throws that line in there. I'm like, please call Sheena already for Dancing with the Stars, please, at this point. Um, but I just, the Dancing with the Stars of it all, too, is that I know this was heavily focused on Ariana and Tom's journey this season, but I kind of would have liked to have seen a little bit more about Dancing with the Stars. Like, I thought we would get scenes of, like, dance rehearsals and things of that nature. Maybe it didn't line up timing-wise, but I thought that would have kind of been interesting. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's, like, some kind of arrangement because it's an ABC thing and not an NBC Universal thing, um, but it would have been cool. Anyways, Ariana's like, will you come every night? And she was like, yeah, I want to come as much as I can. And a talking head says, I completely get why Ariana was cast for Dancing with the Stars. And honestly, I'm used to this, you know, coming in second, third, fourth in this group. And then she takes out a makeup compact. She's like, but then I just remind myself, it's not personal. Let her live her life and thrive. And it is what it is. I just says it like she is like said it like a mil like it's her campaign slogan. Like just let her live her life. And it is what it is. I've come in second, third, fourth. Sheena, you are, Sheena, lean into, you are, you can be number one if you want it. You started this damn show. Believe in yourself, Sheena. Believe in yourself. Believe in yourself. Don't use anybody else. Believe in yourself. A-P-P-E-L-E-S. Apples. Okay. Anyways, Ariana said she had a nice night the other night. She just ordered Thai food and watched Mulan. I hope you cleaned up that Thai food. Um, and she was like, very opposite of my night. We went to Melrose Place. Everybody, everybody came. Schwartz and Tori, I think, are going to go on a date. Remember Tori, Sheena's friend? She's like, they're going to go on a date, make out. And it's like, if you're not dating Joe, then I guess you can go on a date with Tori. And Ariana goes, I have my issues with Joe that I think are very valid. But if I was her and you were taking me on swan boat dates... And we flash back to two days earlier when they're in the swan boat of like, who's steering this Schwartz? Ariana goes, and you're taking me home to meet my family. You're taking, taking her home to meet your family. I would think you're her girlfriend. You don't want the title, but you want to do all the things of what it is to be in a relationship. That's a fuck boy. That's a situation ship, Ariana says. And she was like, yeah. Um, I will say too, though, there is a part of that where um, it could have, I don't know. There is a part of that I don't know. It's uh, Zikes. Anyways. Okay. We go to the next scene and Sandoval and Schwartz in a talking head. is like, he's like, whenever I hear um happier ever after, I imagine Cinderella and Prince Charming just like going off into the sunset. And then Katie's like, I thought my future and forever was going to be with Tom. And now it's not. And I don't know who it's going to be with. It might just be me, myself and I, Katie says. And then Lala on her talking head says, happily ever after means for me, complete independence, bitch, which is what I have, where I am not relying on anybody to give me what I want. And little Lala's like, what about me? And then we flash forward to August 18th. This August 18th scene, we are at this non-alcoholic spirit store that we saw Lala do a brief scene. She is with her brother. Uh, this is pre-dreadlock, so he's growing out his hair. He's not full Adam Duritz from Counting Crows yet, 
her brother Easton, who I believe co-hosts her podcast with her, right? So they're talking about, did you like tequila when you drank, Lala asked. And I guess Easton doesn't drink as well. And Lala says, we've always known that alcoholism has run in our family. And with Easton, after I got sober, he didn't like the way he was acting when he was drinking. And there just came to a point where he gave it up. And hasn't picked up a drink ever since. Congratulations, dude. That's awesome. Now, Sheena comes in. She's like, hi, Sheesh. We're trying tequila replacements, yo. Non-alcoholic. And Easton's like, do you guys have anything that's like more vodka? So they're doing these tastings of the vodka and the tequila. And listen, I, I have feelings about this just because I don't know. And I guess the feelings almost say more about me than it, like, you know, if you want to have non-alcoholic stories, have it like, great. If it makes you feel good or makes you feel like you're a part of something or gives you that kind of brain hit that makes you feel, I don't know, whatever, whatever, whatever you want to do for me personally, I'm like, well, that doesn't make a lot of sense because I don't drink casually. And when I drink, I don't, I mean, this, this is what I'm saying. It says more about me when I drink, I don't drink. Cause I'm like, I love the taste. I will say though, I have gotten a taste over the years for a martini. My dad got me on those, uh, years and years ago. And I, you know, I grew to enjoy like a nice martini at a dinner. I was like really nice. And my mom really loved wine and, and all that intake, like all the bullshit stories that go with wine and stuff like that. So I don't care whatever floats your boat. Right. I don't think a non-alcoholic bar would work. I'm sorry, Carl Radke, but Lala doing a dirty martini with faux vodka. I mean, if it makes her feel good, sure. Anyways, they're doing this whole story, this whole store scene. And Lala goes, we've, we've come a long way since the, the old school old duels that my dad used to drink. But Lala says, my imagination would make me think I'm super fucked up if I drink this, which also that's interesting though. Like, I don't know enough as a non-sober person. Like if you are tricking yourself into thinking that you're fucked up, aren't you then still isn't your brain then still like, oh, I'm, tr uh, you, do you know what I'm saying? Like, are you then, is your brain, are you hitting that button of like wanting to be fucked up and wanting that feeling of losing control? Isn't that a little dangerous as well? Or is that just salve to a wound, you know, a band aid uh, of some sort? Anyways, anyway, uh, Lala is like, you know, talking about, Hey, Sheena's like, how was going into Tom Tom uh, to talk about the uh, having the the baby thing over at Lisa's? And then Lala goes, uh, Tom offered me his sperm. And we cut to five days earlier, a scene in Tom Tom with Lisa, Lala, Schwartz, and Sandoval. And Lala goes, the only thing that comes from the straight men is the cum. And Lala. And then Sandoval's like, do you want my cum, dude? I have healthy cum, dude. And Schwartz is like, no. And Lala goes, I was like, ah, no, no. And she was like, how do you feel like this, Easton? And Easton's like, I feel really good. I think she's making an incredible decision. Talking about Lala getting the sperm donor. And then Lala goes, for a moment, he sprung on me. I just want you to know that like, I would be comfortable with the fact that you probably will never find a man if you do this. And Easton was like, well, let's not put it that bad. But that's what you said, Easton. I said, men are fucking shitty, Easton says. And there's a slim few good ones. And now the lifestyle that you're choosing to have a kid by yourself, Easton's saying, I don't know if that's going to thin it out even more. And that's all I'm saying. And she's like, she already has a kid by herself. That is very true, Easton says. Lala said, the last thing I'm concerned about or even think about is, will I be able to find a man with two children? And Lala in the scene goes, and by the way, uh, Kim Kardashian, and she goes, she still gets men, of course. Lala goes, I've thought about this long and hard. I've prayed about it. I, this is what I want to do. And there's not one person that could change my mind. Which, by the way, it says everything you need to know about Lala. There is no people that can change her mind about anything. Nobody, nobody, no fan, no friend. Nobody can change Lala's mind about anything. Have fun. Have fun being rigid. But to this scene's point, this is great, man. I This is the part about Lala I totally get. I'm like, good for you, man. You love being a mom? Do it. You're awesome. And also, I agreed with Easton in this scene. Man, man we, we're shitty. Uh, even the good ones, we fuck up. Uh, right and left. So there are a slim few good men to choose from. So, uh, you know, he, he makes a point. I thought that was, I don't really listen to their podcast. I've read a bunch of recaps, but I thought that made sense, right? But it is interesting, this scene with Lala and the scene that, you know, it gets cut. But this, anyways, Lala goes, maybe I should make a mocktail book. Move over, Ariana. Oh, very telling, Lala. 
Okay, now we're at a scene with uh, we're a scene with the Toms and they pull up to this house. And by the way, Tom, it looks like he's driving like a black Bentley. What the fuck, dude? What, what is going? Did somebody loan it? Why, why? Why are you in a black Bentley? Why? Is it because you had paparazzi following you and you want him to think you're a baller? Like, dude, I would have loaned you my, my Corolla. Like, this is ridiculous. What a way to show the world that you got your head screwed on straight. You're not worried. You're, you're keeping your finances tight. Good for you, Tom. But like this, you're already showing up. You're like, even if we didn't know this was Tom, and even if we didn't know Tom had cheated on Ariana and all this stuff, you would be like, who's this douchebag? You know what I'm saying? Oh, by the way, when we were driving yesterday to the Talking Heads thing, we saw, guess who was right, like drove right past us in traffic? David Foster and uh, Catherine McPhee. Yeah, Catherine McPhee was driving and David Foster was in the passenger seat and they were both on their phones. Cause it was kind of bumper to bumper traffic, but they were both on their phones. But I was like, and that's one of the talents I have is that I can spot a celebrity like that. I was like, holy shit, that's Catherine McPhee and David Foster. And the other talent I have, I've said this is, you know, TMZ, they'll do that thing of like, can you guess the celebrity? And it'll like show a picture of like a person now, like a, like a, a celebrity that used to be a celebrity, but it's them now. And I'll always be able to guess the celebrity. That's, that's a big talent folks. I don't know how to make money off that, monetize it, but that's if you if anybody knows how I can, please reach out to me. So Tom pulls up, he gets out of this douchebaggery car. He's like, oh, what's up, dude? And he comes in, he's like, hey, what's up, dude? What's up, guys? What's up? How you doing? We meet Ashley and Doug, Tom's realtors. You shouldn't be encouraging this man buying any kind of house. The girl's like, we saw the car and it's it's amazing. It looks like the Batmobile. And he's like, Doug's like, midlife crisis. And Santa was like, yes, yes, dude. All right. So these people are like, welcome to our new listing. And then Schwartz comes in with his bleach blonde hair. He's like, honey, I'm home. And they're like, look at that hair. Oh my God, that's scary. And then guess what Sandoval does? Guess what Sandoval does? Just in your mind, what do I say he keeps doing this season? Well, guess what? He does it again. When everybody's commenting on Schwartz's hair, he goes, huh, I know what you guys are thinking. <laughs> does the curtain match the drape? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm talking pubic hair. You know what I'm saying, dude? Hey, no, for real, though. Do you bleach your pubes, dude? Can I see? Can I check it out in this new lifting bathroom, dude? But he immediately, these are just, these are realtors. What the fuck? You're making, you're making, you're making, you're making pube jokes in front of the realtors? Like if I was with realtors, I'd be like, are we even sure this guy has any kind of financial backing at all? Anyway, Schwartz is like, ha, 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 ha. No, my pubes are the same. He's like, he does that joke for everybody. And then we go to their talking head and Santa's like, hey, D Tom, did you hear that Ariana got a new house, dude? And they flash up like Ariana, $1.6 million house in the hills. And Schwartz is like, oh, I do. That's amazing. And Tom's like, officially, I'm going to need a new roommate, dude. So we're back in the scene and Schwartz is like, outside, it was like a little, like, leave it to Beaver. We want like a dojo. And he goes, I have some qualms about, um, living with him and according to the internet um they say that reflects poorly on me and uh it's a terrible decision as Sh like sandoval picks up his iced coffee and he's sipping it in the talking head also schwartz we don't say these things for our health like right like we're not like oh i love like i mean obviously we're miserable in our own way <laughs> we're miserable in our own lives that's why we say those things but also i think we said those things because it's genuinely a bad idea like, there's no part of like, well, there's not going to be years later where I was like, ah, I was tough on those guys. It was a pretty great idea for two guys in their 40s to live together after they've been through really, really horrible relationship woes, you know, that they've caused. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, those two people should be living. Together. Like, that's a house where you like, oh, that should be on an FBI watch list house, you know? But Schwartz is like, um, it might stunt my growth as an individual, but I think it'll be fun. Yeah, dude. Yeah. So this lady's like, it's big enough for you guys. There's a, you know, a detached garage, panel ready refrigerator, dishwasher, thermidor. And then they're seeing the house, like the rooms, like, this is a great view. Yeah, you are in the heart of Studio City right now. So you're basically walkable to all the best restaurants, the best shops, Jackson Studio City. So then they go upstairs. And the, the I mean, it does look awesome. I love this house, man. This is, and he was like, ballpark, our mortgage on this would be like 15,000 a month. 7.5 each. And he's like, yeah, somewhere like that. Ooh, that's gross. 
there's a lot of factors we still have to consider before we really do this because it's a major, major financial commitment. But if I was to move into the house, you know, we could um work on stuff together. We could like write some of the space off, work together on making as much money as possible. What if that like is a new season of The Apprentice? But it's just like helping the Schwartzes and Sandovals, you know, like they just get 10 people and they bring them in. They're like, as you know, we are known for not making money. OK, but this space, we are going to make money. Who would like to be our apprentice? What's up, dude? Uh, my name's Sandoval. Uh, there's some pretty looking Bettys here. Now, I know in a working environment, you're not supposed to say that. <laughs> but welcome to the dojo. Yeah. Can I see your boobs? <laughs> Have you seen a galaxy light? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Anyways. So then they go see the backyard. There's a putting green. Wow. And Santa was like, yeah, yeah. There's a swing. Yeah. But there isn't a pool. There doesn't look like there's a pool from what I'm seeing. And that's where Santa Ball likes to do some of his best dirty work. Remember when he had those like 18 year olds over at the, the cool pool party? He's like, hey, you guys ever been to Burning Man, dude? Anyway, I don't know. These I know these real estate people are probably excited to be on TV, but I don't know. Santa goes, me and Schwartz being in the house, I knew the two of us would eventually wind up together, dude. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, that scene scared the shit out of me. That literally, and just all you all you parents out there with daughter, just just warn them. Make them watch scenes like that. Anyways, we come back. We're in a new scene. We have a slow jam. We're at Sheena and Brock's Marina Del Rey apartment. Uh, uh, she's making like Swedish meatballs or something. What a queen of cooking. Ariana sings songs. Hello. And she is like, how are we doing? And I guess this is like after the pool day, the, the, the beach episode, this was later that night. So all the, the people are coming in. We got Allie, DJ James Kennedy, um, Katie Maloney. You have, um, uh, Tori, the girl that uh, is flirting with Katie Maloney and Schwartz. So Sheena's like, okay, I'll be back in a few minutes. Um, I'm going to go check on Summer. And Allie's talking to Lala. And Allie goes, I think I'm going to unshare my location with Sheena right now. Because we know Sheena has like everybody's location. And Lala's like, right now? And we checked to five days earlier when Sheena is talking about following Katie Maloney's location and Max Boyan's location. And so Allie is coming up with this thing. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to unshare my location just to fuck with Sheena. And Lala goes, Oh, Oh, while we're, while we're all here to buffer for you. And by the way, I was thinking this was a joke, but then as I'm rewatching it right now, I think it's like, no, I just don't want her to like know any of my business. But anyways, Allie goes, yeah. And then she'll go to check like a month from now and she'll be like all suspicious through a month from now. Sheena will know that immediately. That is how, I mean, I, I also think Sheena would be a good bounty hunter. Like she could really track down criminals. I think she has the wherewithal and the know-how anyways. She's like, oh my God, she'll be suspicious. And then Sheena will be like, Allie's banging somebody in the friend group. And then Lala goes, although that was actually true with Raquel. <laughs> she Lala having to pause and go, actually, that that was true with Raquel. So I guess it's not that funny of a joke. And it probably is believable that, okay, yeah. Now that I'm saying it out loud, it makes sense. Anyways, Allie says in a talking head that she thinks location sharing should just be for a select few people, family. And then Allie asks Lala, does she have yours? And Lala goes, fuck no. Are you crazy? Allie in the talking head goes, I just think that Sheena likes to spy and see who's with who and who's where. And then Lala goes, this is Sheena at all times. And she's clicking on the phone with the nails. <laughs> and we see all of these montage of Sheena laughing with the nails clicking. <laughs> and Lala goes, all day. I'm like, you got to put it down. So Allie goes to unshare the location. And she goes, Lala, I just did it. And then Sheena immediately, it's a not notification. And Allie's like, oh my God, I already regret it. And Sheena checks that you must get a notification if you unshare your loca location. So she keeps looking at the phone. And she's like, what? What's going on here? And she picks up her phone to check it. And you can tell it's like registered. You, you can tell it's registered, but she doesn't say anything. And I just think Sheena does. Sheena is a keeper of information. And that's okay. You always have that one friend. And I think that makes Sheena feel powerful in a sense. And it makes her feel safe and secure. And potentially that makes her feel that way because of her OCD issues. Anyways, DJ James Kennedy is like, Sheena, are we going to listen to your song? And she's like, yeah, we are. And then, 
She's like, this is my new one called Apples. He's like, finally a new one. If you're about to debut another version of A Good as Gold, I'm going to shit myself. Here's Good as Gold, the classical. Okay, here we go. And she goes, here, it's Good as Gold, country version. Oh, country version. Because we're good as gold. Good as gold. And Sheena actually kind of likes that. Anyways, Allie and DJ James Kennedy have a talking head. And Allie's like, I call his American accent Hunter. And DJ James Kennedy's laughing. He's like, hey, guys, Hunter here. We're going to start our interview process. And they're like, where are you from? Uh, North Philadelphia originally. But uh, and Allie's like, no, you're Southern. He's like, sorry, sorry. Where am I? Oh, anyways, we do the A-P-P-L-E-S. How you like them? And everybody's like having fun, dancing around. I like this. I like seeing them. This is like you believe that they actually hang out as a friend group, which makes actually then the serious scenes more it resonates more when you have scenes like this i would have argued to have kept this in because it just shows these people hanging out you can reckon like you're like oh shit yeah that's a hangout sesh like everybody's like having fun okay now we go to august 25th this scene is are you a girl's girl it's entitled are you a girl's girl we're at the write-off room and we see dj james kennedy spinning on the ones and twos and we see a country uh we see a, a acoustic guitar on stage and Allie is premiering her new song. She's going to perform. Schwartz and Brock are walking up to the uh, the venue. Allie's uh, greeting everybody. And Allie's like, thanks for coming. Oh, my God. Thanks for coming for Allie. Allie Bally. And this is Allie and DJ James Kennedy's first collab. And I was like, we said we wanted to make music together. And we finally like we did it. And in a talking head, she says, music has always been a really big part of my life. I got my first guitar when I was 11 years old. I'm 13 now. No, she says, I would play out around my hometown in Ohio. When James met me, I was like a 26-year-old girl trying to figure out what I wanted to do with my life. He brought that side out of me, and it means a lot to me. What a way to put yourself out there, Ali. And then we see Katie and Ariana walking up. So everybody's here. Um you know, I will say, I wonder if Allie was livid that it didn't make the initial season. Like they shot this for a scene for the season, but I'm sure she's happy. It's in the secrets revealed. I did. I mean, this is like promoting her thing. So you want it on the main show, I would imagine. So everybody's filing in. It's all lovey dovey. Everybody's hugging. And, uh, we, uh, Oh, Oh, there's okay. Sorry. I was seeing if Santa ball was there, but it doesn't look like it's, Anyways, they're joking about checking Sheena's location because she's not there yet. And Ariana's like, wait, do you have Sheena's location, Schwartz? And he's like, no. Um, and then they say they uh, <laughs> that Ariana can't track Dan's location because he has an Android, which cracks me up. So anyway, she Allie's on stage, makes a speech thanking everybody of like, thank you. And thank you to James Kennedy for believing me and wanting to help share my music with the world. And James in the audience is like, I love you so much, Ali Bali. And she starts singing really pretty voice. Uh, I do not have that high of a vocal range, so I will not uh, uh, sing it for you. But I will say there's an audience reaction. And Ariana looks so elated to see Ali singing. And it's just a point to be made because also, you know, Ariana had that same kind of like excitement when Lala was doing like pin the sperm on the... Um, you know, the ladies reproductive system at the, the party at Lisa's place. Like she genuinely seems to get a kick out of supporting her friends. And I think that's really important. Anyway, DJ James Kennedy's like Taylor Swift is definitely a huge inspiration for Ali growing up. She's very talented. I'm so proud of her. You know, we definitely have just started this musical journey together. Like this is a new thing for us. We hear more of the song. He's like, could we maybe be the next Sonny and Cher? Jay-Z and Beyonce, I mean, of course. Never say never, right, right? Yeah, wouldn't that be amazing if they are like Jay-Z and Beyonce? Ha, Rock Nation, TJ James Kennedy Nation. Throw your diamonds up. Anyways, we see Zachary Reality, uh, her best friend who's been on the show before. He's great, so we saw him in the audience supporting. Okay, so we're done with that scene. Then we move, boom, dump, bum, bum, bum. And Sheena's like, cringiest thing I have done in the midst of a heartbreak, she says in a talking head. I mean, where do we get, begin? Maybe with the penguin? And we flash back to 2019, her talking to Dodie and saying, I looked into it, the aquarium. You can adopt a penguin. I named her Spot it. Spot, if he's still mad at me after or I got him a fucking penguin, then we're done. Remember that season? Lala goes, I feel like, Getting over somebody is getting under someone else. And Sheena's like, ugh. And Lala goes, and having self-loathing after. I mean, like, oh, you hit it? 
like once the vodka goggles kind of faded, I'm like, ah, get out of my bed. Little Lala's like, fuck yeah, so many times it hurt. Okay, now we go to August 19th. August 19th scene, and it says, you fucking deal with it, is this scene entitled. And there's some kind of party, club party. There's a pool, and it's Courtney's birthday party, which is Sheena's sister. So this is her birthday party. We see, like, a photo booth set up. Uh, all the girls, Lala, Ariana, Katie, Sheena, Courtney, they're all there in their little swimsuits. And Tori goes up to Sheena. She goes, I actually really like Katie. Really? Sheena says. Tori's like, why are you making that face? I because I thought you really like shorts. And she's like, yeah, that's done. I'm done. Okay, good. I I can't like I you know I can't make it an effort. He needs to work for that. Love him as a friend, Schwartz. I had so much fun with him. Tori says. Uh, and Sheena's like, oh, so is this becoming a thing with you and Katie? And Tori is like, I would love it too. And I have to say, once again, I've said this all season long. Every time Tori, it's just she's so damn young. I don't care if it's with Katie. I don't care if it's with Schwartz. It's it just comes off like wrong. No offense to Tori. I know, you know, like uh, younger people are attracted to older people. I know that, but it just, it's, it's, you know, then you hear the stories after the fact and it, it's not good. It's, it, it ends up damaging. Right. But she's like all excited to take Sheena of like, I want something to happen with Katie. And she like, I love that. And then Katie walks by and kind of gives her like Riz kind of look. You know, we've got Butch Katie all of a sudden. I loved Butch Katie from earlier in the season. She's like, what's up, everybody? It's me, Katie Maloney. What you fuck nuts doing? No, she comes up. She's like, what are you, hey, hey, what are you guys talking about? And she's like, you? And he's like, what are you talking about me? She's like, get over here, Katie. And Tori's like, cheers. And then Katie's all in black. And Sheena's like, oh, it's like Barbie versus Oppenheimer. <laughs> and then Sheena's like, I'm going to go and let you guys talk. Uh, and then Katie and Tori, Katie's like, what is she saying? And Tori's like, nothing. And she's like, what? I just told her I have a crush on you, Katie. Oh, okay. That thing? Okay. And then they're just looking at each other. She's like, you look so pretty, Katie. Thanks. So do you. Yeah. And then Tori goes, I want to kiss you. And then Katie takes her by the head and kisses her. So like, I'll kiss you first. You want to kiss me? Well, I'm going to kiss you first. How about that? Oh, tequila Katie rides again. Room, room. She really does. Like, I mean, like she is so, she is so much more confident than I ever would be. Anyways, the girls are sitting down, Sheena and Lala and Katie and Ariana. And Sheena's like, I hear there was a smooch I missed. And Ariana's like, from who? And Katie's like, who? And then Lala goes, you and Tori? And Katie's like, yeah. And she's like, okay, but where are you at with this? Is this just fun when you have tequila or do you actually like her? No, I like, I'm having fun hanging out with her, dude. I told her I'm just like trying to enjoy the process, getting to know people. I'm not rushing anything with anyone. Wow. When Katie actually, now it almost becomes like a dude of like, hey, I'm not looking to get settled down. You know what? I want to keep keep my options open. You know, I'm not going to fucking run, but I, I don't need to be, I don't need a ball and chain right now. You know what I'm talking about? I got options. <laughs> but yeah, I love that. She's like, I'm not rushing anything with anyone right now. Because the last time I did that with someone, I was like, oh, my God, I'm like in love with this person. And I got like really hurt, Butch Katie says. And I'm talking that she goes, as a woman dating fucked up, complicated men, there's been a lot of disappointment. It feels like charity to have sex with men these days. They don't deserve it. Why? So you want to not text me back? Cool. She, I mean, by the way, Katie kills it. Katie makes so much sense. Hell yeah. That would be the perspective you would have, right? Good on you, Katie. I know I'm making fun of her voice, but I was like, I was like, hell yeah. Keep like, be protective, you know? But anyways, in the scene, she's like, from here on out, I'm just going to like keep myself open and like focus on how I feel. And until I feel like there's an actual connection with somebody, I just want to like enjoy whatever it is. And she's like, yeah. And Lala goes, how was that conversation with Sandoval? What happened? And, and she's like, what happened with Sandoval? Oh, he stormed out, you guys. I just feel like my song went viral yesterday and everyone in the world has heard it. Not Tom Sandoval. And we flash back to five hours earlier of like, I read a song about it. He's like, what, about our affair? Yeah, there's one line that says, from a Ferrari to a Jetta, thought you knew better. And Tom runs out. He's like, I'm out of here, dude. Fuck this shit, dude. I'm grabbing my man bags and getting out of here, dude. Keep cacking in on my misery. I mean, come on. It's not making that much care. Are you kidding me? It's not like it's fucking Dua Lipa. Like, come on, Tom. Give me a break. 
Let Sheena have apples, which is a good bop. Let her have this. <laughs> it's so funny. And Tariana goes, imagine if I'm every person that Taylor Swift has ever dated got so butter about every song she's ever writ written. And Kitty goes, do not worry about his fucking feelings. Yeah, this is about you. You fucking suck, Tom. Deal with it. And she's like, I don't personally like to kick someone when they're down. Fuck that. He's not down. No one's kicking him. The man is a loser. Facts, Ariana says. I love it, man. In fact, I, <laughs> I want more Butch Katie. I want more. Hey, smell my finger. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. Anyways. Okay. Now we flash to July 29th. This is, could be my favorite. I talked about this last week's episode, but we're going to do the full thing right now. So Tom flanked by Schwartz, Kyle Chan, one of Kyle Chan's friend goes to like Bottega hangout. I don't know. Tom is in like this red and white striped sweater. He's like, Hey, table for four, dude. Welcome to Bottega taboo. And they're like, oh, nice, dude. Couches, nice. And the lady's like, enjoy. Thanks. And the waiter, like, Tom's like, oh, I see you got something with matcha, dude, because I'm doing that because I'm not doing alcohol. And then so Schwartz is like, can we try the black and gold sake? And I used to do that when we were in Japan. I used to speak Japanese. And Kyle Chan's like, that's what all the white boys say. Yeah, right, dude. Um, should we do caviar bumps, dude, Schwartz says. And he's like, you never had a caviar bump? Oh, wow. That's crazy. I love that. Everybody at the table is just like, we've all done bumps. We've just not done gravy or bumps. So they bring out the sake. They bring out Tom's matcha. And uh, he's like, oh, my God, we're doing this for you, Tom. We're sacrificing our livers, man. He goes, because I haven't been drinking, dude, I think it's a good time to like maybe freeze my sperm. <laughs> Um, being completely clear headed has still made me make really poor choices, like potentially freezing my sperm to procreate at, uh, no, I'm doing shorts. He's like, um, <laughs> being completely sober, dude has like really, um, it made me, I think clear. I've never thought more clear in my life, dude. Um, I think now is the time to potentially just really, um, you know, have a baby. Yeah, dude. So I'm going to free the old sperm sickles. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, dude, it's time. But I just love that he says with this say, I think now is the time to freeze my sperm. Sure. Why not? Sounds. And I also think that maybe I should go buy a couple handguns and explosives. I think now is the right time. This guy is that's not making good decisions at all. So Schwartz is like, have you done any research? What's the process? Yeah, dude. No. I mean, remember I had my sperm tested last year? And Schwartz is like, I remember I was with you. We got one year earlier, the doctor's like, the normal look of a sperm is 14%. You came in at 6%. And he's like, do you think that has to do with stress, drinking? And the doctor's like, I think drinking a lot, uh, super tight clothing, drugs, cheating with one of uh, your girlfriend's best friends. And Kyle's like, you still want to have kids. He's like, I want the opt-in, you know, Kyle. That's one of the reasons why I want to, you know, try to keep the house if I can. <laughs> and Kyle's like, well, it totally makes sense that you want to keep the house. Are you done with your apology tour? Kyle Chan asks. Uh, I don't know, dude. I saw Katie today. I know, you know, if you can be BFF with Lala, eventually you can come around to me, you know? And she was like, Lala's been so chill. Me and Lala are connecting. And Santa goes, yeah, dude, I'm digging her vibe, dude. Yeah. Huh. Huh. It turns out when Lisa scared the shit out of certain castmates, they're super nice to good old T.O.M. You know what I'm saying? I'm digging her vibe, dude. I might hit it and quit it. You know what I'm saying, dude? <laughs> And then Santa goes, guys, this is seriously what he goes, guys, what if I asked Lala on a date, dude? And I know he's like trying, like, it's like a bit like, oh, ha, ha. but at the same time in his warped mind, he's like, that could be a storyline, dude. That's how I live my life. Gotta do storylines. That could be a good one, dude. And then Schwartz is like, maybe I could date Lala. And then there's a competition between the two. Anyways, Kyle's like, what? And Schwartz is like, she would say, fuck no. And Kyle's like, so do you feel like you're ready to mingle? He's like, yeah, dude. And then Schwartz is like, how many people have you had sex with since Rachel? And he's thinking about it. And she's like, you have to think about it. No, dude, I'm thinking about if I want to be honest or not. <laughs> and he goes, and then he's like, oh, I love Sandoval being so honest to admit that he would thinking about lying. Like, oh, I'm trying to think if I want to be honest or not for the first time. Um, And then he immediately blurts out. He goes, three? So, you know, that's like six, right? Like three. And then Schwartz goes, holy shit, dude, that's a lot. 
oh man. And he goes, sober? <laughs> and then Schwartz is like, what the fuck? That's not even possible, dude. I love that Schwartz is like, having sex sober? What? That's even a thing? I thought that was a myth, like Paul Bunyan, dude. Are you kidding me? Dude, you had sex sober? I've never had sex sober. Kyle, what about you, man? But then I'm talking to Ed Schwartz, is like, how does the most vilified, hated man in America get laid right now? I wonder if it's like, are they hate-fucking him? Sandoval's like, the first one was really hard, because it was also like the first one post-Rachel. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> Tom, and taking his skin-tight blouse off. I gotta say, dude, be gentle with me, dude. This is my first one. Um, I was in a nine <laughs> Now you're really. <laughs> Please be gentle with me, dude. No butt stuff on the first one, okay, dude? I'm very vulnerable right now. Please, I want to make love, dude. I just want to feel close, skin on skin, like those baby photos, you know, with like newborn babies and their parents. That's what I want this experience to be like. Please. Can we please track it? Who was it? Was it Tori? Oh, was it not Tori? Was it, uh, oh, what was the girl that, uh, Billy Lee, uh, the friend, what was the name? Oh, was it Billy Lee? Who was the first one? Who was the, we must know who this first one was. But then Schwartz totally just blowing smoke up this man's ass. Like they do every fucking scene. He's like, Oh, I gotta tell you, Tom, that takes courage on some level. He's like, it took a lot of courage, dude. Like, like, A, you're still in love with this human that you know you can't be with. Rachel, I've only had sex with one person, and I think you know who it is. And her name rhymes with flow. <laughs> I just like, that takes a lot of courage and bravery. And then Sandoval goes, yeah, dude, it really did. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm proud to be an American where Tom fucks over. And I will fight. Oh, my God. He's like patting himself on the back. He's crying. Oh, that sucks. And Schwartz is like, I'm proud of you, dude. You were still in love with somebody else and you wouldn't have had sex with somebody that you're not in love with. Fucking like Nobel Peace Prize shit, dude. Like for real. Like pound it out, man. That's amazing, dude. Like even when he said is ridiculous, like <laughs> I know you're in love. It's like if you're in love with somebody, maybe wait until those feelings subside until you like pick somebody else to get into your weird fucked up tangled web of like tanning and fart pills. Um, yeah, I just, and also Schwartz, I love is like, who's going to fuck like the most hated man in America. Schwartz knows people, these guys go anywhere. The girls throw them. I've seen it. Like, it doesn't matter what he's done. It's never going to matter. Girls throw themselves at th these guys in particular, but people on TV in general. So anyways, this lady, I guess the owner of the bar, she has like this really hot pink dress on. And one of it has like a hand over the boob. It's like, that's the look of the dress. And she's like, hello, guys. What's up? Uh, how are you? And it's like, good, dude. We have something special for you. This is our dessert with our signature black caviar. What's your name? Tom, dude. Tom, can you be the first to try? Uh, wait, dude. Feed me. Do it, dude. Do it. And she's like, oh, okay. Actually, I never did it before, but I do it for you. Thanks so much, dude. And she feeds him. And they're like, your dress is awesome, dude. Um, and it's like, okay, guys, enjoy. And they're like, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. She walks away. And Kyle's like, she's hot. And Tom's like, yeah, she is hot. And Schwartz is like, she's got Barbie energy. And I'm talking to Ed. Tom's like, I don't want to move on from Rachel, dude. Like, I still love her very much. But she's being fucking selfish, dude. She's like prioritizing her mental health. That's fucking diabolical, dude. That's the fucking greatest betrayal, dude diabolical working on yourself like that's a maniac it's a fucking maniac dude so he goes up to the girl in the pink dress and he strolls up and he's like um what's up dude um hey what's what's your instagram dude and he's talking to him, he's like what can i do rachel's obviously made a decision i can it's the best I, best thing i can do right now is get myself out there right now so he's now giving his rap to this girl like you know like really trying to impress her he's like hey dude um me and my girl of nine years, we recently broke up. Uh, then he's like, I had an affair, basically. And it, like, fucking blew up in the news, dude. Like, it was everywhere. Like, I'm not even that famous, you know? <laughs> and the lady goes, ha, 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 ha. Weird, weirdo behavior. He walks back. 
He's like, that girl in the pink, dude, she's actually she's the owner. And Schwartz like, sweet, did she Google you? And he's like, no, not yet, dude. And Kyle's like, let me give her a warning then. And they're like, no, dude, no. So weird. Fucking weird. Okay, and the final scene, Secrets Revealed scene, is them in San Francisco. And it was the first night and when they were all dressed up like, you know, characters from like the 20s or the 30s or whatever. Whatever, you know, decade. And uh, they're all dressed up like gangsters. And it turns out it was a murder mystery party. So we have Brock, like, all of a sudden die when they're talking. He's like, ah, I'm dead. I'm a pig farmer and somebody's killed me. Ah, you said they a pig farmer's daughter. Help. My budgie smuggler is showing. And he dies and everybody has to. But I got to tell you, folks, it's not even worth recapping because I hate these murder mystery things so much. And you can tell they spent a lot of time editing and making it like old timey. And it still was boring as hell. And even Katie's like, this is dumb and it is dumb. So we're not going to even cover that. So that brings us to the end where they're doing the wrap ups in the talking heads. And the producer asks Schwartz and Sandoval says, what lessons have you learned this season? And Schwartz is like, just like, don't have an affair. It's just never worth it. And uh, um, I guess if you do end up with that person and you live happily, uh, happily ever after, but still just like, no. And then Sam was like, no, dude, moral of the story. Do not have an affair. Good. We've learned something. Now to Sheena and Lala, she was like, I need to start just having a little more Lala in me. Say it with my chest and be okay with not being liked by everyone. You got half of that, right? Lala says, I only know how to be like solid with someone or be someone's enemy. So I'm finding that we don't need to be so extreme, yo. We can find the gray. That's a good thing. Like the gray of Sheena's tooth back in the earlier seasons. Katie says, sometimes you just got to stop reaching out to people and see how many dead plants you encounter. He's like, exactly. In 20 years, I don't really want to be holding on to any grudges or be angry. I want to look back on these days as the best days of my life. And they both smile. And Katie's like, whoa. Sandoval and Schwartz are like, it's been good, man. Yeah, it's been interesting. I don't know if it's been good. It's been actually pretty fucked up. Sam was like, yeah, dude, let's get out of here. And then they get up from the chairs. We're out of here, dude. Peace. So that was the Secrets Revealed episode. Uh, I'm so, and I got to tell you, it is so fun just to have fun scenes to talk about. Like, we're not like talking about La La shitting on Ariana. We're not talking, like, it's, it's nice to just kind of laugh at these goofy people. And I truly believe what I say is that we will watch these people do anything. So give us the truth. Just show us their natural interactions. We don't need like the hoopla of some of these things that they feel like they need to go through for the audience. I don't think we need that. At this point, we're so invested. I just want to hear them talk about their actual real feelings and see where we land. It's been a good ride and it's been a good ride with you guys. Thank you for tuning in. We've had a heck of a week for show. So go check them out. Melissa Reich, your Bish therapist, Sarah Heron from Us Weekly, and of course, Christian Doty and Luke Broderick from The Valley and a full recap of The Valley season finale. So check all of that out if you haven't. Thank you for supporting me and we will talk to you very, very soon. Bye baddies.